So let's do some examples. The very first step in doing a binomial probability problem successfully is, is to identify that in fact you have a binomial situation at hand. Watch how I do this. Lucky Larry randomly guesses, so he's randomly guessing, at 10, 10 questions. So that tells me right there we've got 10 trials. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down. He's, he's performing 10 trials, n equals 10. Note in fact that we use little n here for the number of trials because another way to view this is that n is our sample size. You can think of Larry as, you know, answering just 10 random questions randomly from a much larger set of questions where he would also randomly guess at those, okay? But at any rate, that's our sample size. What else do we have there? Each question has five possible responses. If you can't picture this in your head, maybe you should draw a picture. Make a picture if you can't, you know, make one in your head. You got ten questions and five possible different responses for each question. Okay. Now for each one of these questions, he's gonna get it right or wrong. It's like a one or a zero. So even though he can make any one of five choices here, they're really, you know, we're really only interested in you know, one of two things are gonna happen here for question number one. He'll get it he'll get it right or wrong. One or zero. You know, think of it like that. Right or wrong, one or zero, right or wrong, and so forth and so on right or wrong. There are two possible things that can occur for each question. Binomial. By meaning two. Okay. What's my success probability for each one? Well, let's see. He's randomly guessing at each one, meaning he's going to sort of close his eyes and stand on one foot, randomly guess one of these and hope that it's correct. What is it? Can you tell me? You know? What's the chance that he gets it right? I bet you know. It's 20%, right? Or one-fifth or .20, however you want to do it. What's the chance that he gets all of them correct? Let me label these. Problem one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so for problem one, what's the chance that he gets all of them correct? Well, you know what? I skipped over a step here. My next step really needs to be to, to define my random variable, but I know what that should be now by looking at, at this first question. The chance he gets all of them correct. And look at the next question. The chance he gets at least a B, well, we'll talk about what a B means maybe. Chance that he passes, I don't know what that means. It looks like we're concerned with the number that he gets correct, right? So that's what I'm going to define. I'm, that's my next step. So the first step is identifying a, that it's a binomial situation and then writing down your number of trials, and then you want to write down your success probability, and, and, and also at some point you need to define your random variable so you know what this, thing's, what this thing is. It's the number of questions Larry answers correct a lie. Okay? All right? So problem number one, we want to know the probability that x equals 10, right? The chance that he gets all of them correct. Well, hey, you know, by independence, this is real simple. It's 0 0.20, your success probability, raised to the tenth. And if I drag out my calculator over here, I see that that's uh, 0 0.2 raised to the tenth, which is, whoa, less than one part in a million, right? It's 1.024 times 10 to the negative seventh. Super small. Super, super small. Or you could follow the formula, if you like. Remember the binomial formula? You'd say it's, well, let's see, 10 choose... 10, I know that I get them all correct, 0.20 to the tenth times 1 minus 0.20 to the, what's, you know, 10 minus 10. 10 minus 10 is 0, so, you know, with all this stuff raised to the 0 is just 1, so that goes away. 10 choose 10 is 1. There's only one way to choose 10 things from 10 things. Ah, so this reduces to this, okay? Or, you know, what you probably also want to get in the habit of doing is using your calculator. You could use binome which is it? PDF or CDF? Go to the sign, PDF. P equals. Just remember, P equals. Use P, PDF, if you see the equal sign there, okay? Binom PDF, number of trials is 10. My success probability is 0 0.20, and I want to know the chance that I get all 10. And if you put that in your calculator, you'll get exactly the same thing. Distribution menu, or up to bind, or up or down to binom PDF, 10 trials, 0.2 and all 10 correct and paste dar and sure enough it's the same thing okay it's the same very good let's do the second one let's do the second one the chance he gets at least a b all right so we got to decide what is a b here all right typically i think you know in, in most of the classes i've taken or taught a b is like 80 percent or above right you get you know a or, or a B is somewhere between 80% and 90%. A is typically like 90% and above. It changes from class to class, but let's go with that. 80% to 90% is a B. So at least a B, by that I mean at least 80%. What's 80% of 10? That's 8, right? So let's write this down. The probability that he gets at least 
uh, b. Another way to say that is the probability that x is at least 8. All right? Because 80 percent of 10 is 8. So I see this sign here. Okay. So right off, I, I know that I want to use that binomial CDF, but it's going the other way. So what I'm, I'm going to do is use the rule for complements and go 1 minus the chance that x is less or equal to 7, right? Because these are disjoint events, right? Being greater than or equal to 8 and less or equal to 7, those are disjoint events if it's integer valued, right? Because here's my sample space for x. x will take on one of those values, so x will either be at least 8 or 7 or less. They are complementary events. They cannot happen at the same time, and no other thing is possible. Okay? Makes sense? So therefore, I can apply the rule for complements. And so, for this, I'm just going to use my calculator. 1 minus binom CDF. I know it's binom CDF, because I'm looking at the sign. I've got 10 trials. Success probability is still 20%. And I put the 7 there, because the 7 is right there. Okay? Let me pull out my calculator. I get 1 minus arrow down to option B there, binome CDF. Okay, got 10 trials, success probability is still 20%, and my X value now is 7. Okay, and I'll go to paste that, press enter. Remember, you have to have the 1 minus there, 7.7926 or so, times 10 to the negative fifth. I'll say that's approximately 7.7926 times 10 to the negative fifth. That's, that's still pretty small pretty small chance. Wow! So if he's guessing randomly, like if he didn't study, the chance he gets at least a B is pretty darn small, isn't it? Gosh! Can he get a C? I don't know. He might be out of luck. What's the chance that he even passes? That's question number three. I'll change the color there to green. Let's see, how do you pass? Uh, typically that's, you know, if 80 to 90 is a B, and 70 to 80 is a C, and 60 to 70 is a D, then you need at least a D, so that's the chance that, you know, what's 60% of 10? That's 6, right? That's the chance that X is at least 6. Okay, can you get 6 right? Sure, but is it, but how likely is it? I'm going to use the rule for complements. 1 minus the probability that X is less or equal to 5, okay? So that's 1 minus binome CDF, 10, comma, 0.2, and this time I put the 5 in there. And again, I know it's binome CDF, not PDF, because of this symbol right there. Pull out my calculator. And in fact, you know, this is almost the same stuff as we had just before, so I'll do second enter to pull that stuff up. And I just have to change this last number there, the 7, to a 5. And press enter. 0 0.00637 approximately. That's pretty dang small. He's got a really small chance of passing. Holy smokes, who would have thought? So he's orange for number 4. This is number four. The chance that he fails the quiz. Oh, well, I know the chance that he passes. The chance that he fails the quiz is just one minus the chance that he passes. And we've already got that. This is that chance, right? So this is just one minus 0 .00637. So that's 0 0.99363, approximately. These are approximate because I remember I rounded before. I rounded up in here, okay? So, but it's just a slight round, okay? Pretty high chance that he fails, right? Let's do number five in blue. The expected number of questions he gets correct. Ah, I know that x is a binomial random variable. Therefore, I have a nice shortcut formula. The expected value of x, or sometimes we write it like this, the mean of x is just n times p, right? n is the number of trials. p is the success probability. That's, let's see, just two. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? If he, if he makes about 20% of the questions, well, 20% of 10 is two. That's how many, on average, he would make if every day he walked in and blindly guessed on a 10 question quiz. That's about how many, that's the rate at which he would get correct answers per day. Let's do seven, in, er, let's do number six now. We'll do it in green. Standard deviation of the number of questions he gets correct. Hey, again, it's a binomial random variable, right? So I know that the standard deviation of it, there's a nice shortcut formula. It doesn't hold in general, but if it's a binomial random variable, you are very, very lucky. Square root of NP times 1 minus P, so that's the square root of 10 times 0.2 times 0.8, because 1 minus 0.2 is 0.8, okay? So, so with my calculator, that turns out to be, let's see, square root symbol, 10 times 0.2 times 0.8, okay? 1.2649 approximately. See, I rounded there just, just a touch. Okay, where should you round? 
I don't know, about there. I like four decimal places. It sort, it sort of depends on the units and what you're working with, right? If you're working with dollars, I don't like to round at all. I, I, I don't want you lopping off any of my dollars. But these are different units. These are numbers of questions we get right. Hey, that's sort of important too. Uh, seven. Let's do seven in black. How does increasing the number of questions affect the distribution of the number he gets correct? Run some simulations to see. Okay, for that I'm going to pull out my mini tab. All right, just in case you're wondering, test questions would pretty much look about like these. Okay, this is, these are the kind of things I'd ask you on a test. I give you this scenario here. I ask for the chance that he gets this many correct, or that many correct, or at least this many correct, or at most that many, or so forth. And also I'll ask you, ask you about the, sta the standard deviation and the mean, or the expected value. Down here at the bottom, I would never ask you to simulate something on an exam. However, I will very likely ask you some something conceptual, like you know, how does increasing the number of questions affect the distribution, or you know, something like that. Now let, let's uh, let's do this simulation. I'll calculate some binomial random variable uh, random numbers there. Let's do this a hundred thousand times. I know what you're thinking. Lucky Larry's only got ten questions. Well, we're going to pretend like he wakes up and takes this ten question quiz every day for the next one hundred thousand days. Okay. That's what you have to that that's what you have to observe over and over. He's doing ten trials each time with a twenty percent success rate. Okay, put that stuff in column one. And then in column two, I'll essentially do the same thing, except I'm gonna increase the number of trials. Not the number of runs in my simulation, but the number of trials. Let's go from ten to like thirty. What's the mean there? What's twenty percent of thirty? Six, right? I'll say ten trials. Here we got thirty trials, and here I'll do say a hundred trials. And over here I'll do say 500 trials. Okay, so he's taking you know longer and longer quizzes as we go left to right. Calculate random data, binomial, column three, 100 trials, and then finally, like so, 500 trials. Okay, so now let's make histograms for these four columns. Okay, great. Hey, there's the one for 500 trials. Spoiler alert. Let me you know, move these down here. All right, so here's the one that we were working our problems with. You can see this is the actual distribution now. Now, really, you kind of want to, I mean, these are the counts out of, you know, 100,000. But if I change this to a relative frequency or percent kind of histogram, you know, you see that you have the exact same change, the exact same shape here, just the, the, the scaling on the y-axis changes so that you got percentages there. And so look, you know, most of the time you're going to get zero or one or two or three right. Occasionally you'll get some you know, four correct, once in a blue moon, you get five or six. Very rarely do you get seven or more, which is consistent with the probabilities we computed. Now what happens, now what, what was the mean there? We calculated that, right? It was two, so it's right there. It happens to coincide with the mode there. Um, what if you increase to 30 trials? Okay, that's the way it looks. What if increased to 100? Whoa, it's looking more and more bell-shaped. As it becomes more and more bell-shaped, look at how it's it's centered very much around the mean. Th this X scale here should really be going from 0 to 500, but they've just zoomed in on the most interesting chunk, right? The mean, let's see, 500 trials, success rate is 20%. 20% of 500 is 100. So that is exactly right there, right there at the mean. So you can see that as the number of trials increases, and you keep the success probability the same, as the number of trials increases, the number of questions he gets right, or this binomial random variable, starts to look more and more bell-shaped, or mound-shaped, or as we're about to call it, normal. This, its behavior is beginning to approach that of a normal random variable.